Welcome back, everyone. I uh, hope you enjoyed your discussions. We're going to continue now with the panel, but I'm just going to move down to the floor, if I may. There we are. A lot easier to do from here. Thanks very much. Uh, I hope you enjoyed your sessions and you got a lot out of that. Uh, now is the chance to, um, well, our question time format, uh, a, a chance for you to put any questions you want or just make a few points uh, and put them to our uh, distinguished panel of MSPs here. Uh, starting on uh, my far right, uh, we have Keith Brown, MSP, who's the Cabinet Secretary uh, for the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work. He's joined by Dean Lockhart from the Conservative Party and Jackie Bailey from the Labour Party, who both are economy spokespersons, and Tavis Scott, former leader and now education spokesperson for the Lib Dems. So thank you very much to our panel. So now it's open to you. We've got about an hour for questions. So uh, who wants to be the first? No one ever wants to be the first. And at the end, there'll be too many hands up and we'll be able to get you in. Eh? Thank you, yes. And could you perhaps just introduce yourself? Uh, yes. Um, now, I wonder, actually, if do you want to stand? I think, I think that's what, yes. Yes, do you want to stand and then say who you are? Because I think that's, that'll work better with the microphone. Sorry, yes. That's really just daunting everybody now, yes. Uh, well, I suppose it's a novelty, if nothing else, to stand in the chamber and speak to uh, the assembled audience. Um, so my name is John Forster. Um, apologies to Cabinet Secretary Brown, because uh, he's already had to take one question from me short time ago, but uh, so I, I'm here wearing several guises. I'm private sector business owner, a former Forster Group, but I'm going to ask a question on behalf of Scotland's Solar Trade Association, so one of the renewable energy sectors that offers such a prominent future for the Scottish economy. Um, ultimately, though, my question will be about the opportunity for business to engage with the Scottish Government, um, because my experience in uh, engaging with a number of the departments has been somewhat mixed. Um, some of it has been absolutely excellent, um, but we have had an example this year, which I'm going to use just for the opportunity, uh, which is around business rates, and perhaps there'll be others in the audience who have faced similar challenges to being a hot topic. Um, we've engaged considerably over the various consultations, plans and strategies around energy, climate change, energy efficiency, etc., that have been being carried out this year, and if you're are underway towards programmes and policies that they will become. Um, we represent an industry that has projected that uh, within the 2030 period that most of those policies are working to, um, we, uh, we foresee an industry that will grow to a £1.5 billion per annum contribution to the Scottish economy. Um, we will grow from little over 1,000 jobs, so unfortunately due to recent cuts in the last couple of years, we will grow to, we reckon, in excess of 10,000 jobs, which will be a decent contribution in jobs terms. But uh, significantly, we expect to produce energy savings for the Scottish economy of around half a billion per annum. Uh, and, and over 50% of that will be of benefit to the business community, who, we, who will be the main uptaker of uh, solar in order to meet many of the challenges that will come from those new policies. Um, so having had excellent engagement, um, we have found it absolutely impossible to meet with either the Cabinet Secretary of Finance, this is not a personal criticism, I'm just reflecting, or with, for example, the, the Barclay Review. Um, and in fact, it, was, it took me to approach the First Minister this morning, and typical for the First Minister, who then said, don't worry, don't worry, give me a card and I'll arrange a meeting, um, which is quite impressive for somebody to her level. But uh, I just think um, it does perhaps, or does it perhaps say something about uh, business engagement, and maybe there are others in the audience who would like to follow with better questions, and the challenges that we sometimes have, because I think the Scottish Government in comparison to the Westminster Government uh, is, is a great deal easier to engage with. Um, but you know what, without that engagement, some of the key messages are easily lost. And the one I've just reflected on with some specific numbers, understandably the First Minister, eyes somewhat lit up at the prospect of those numbers and the benefits to the Scottish economy and society. So business can produce huge benefits, we know that. But of course, if we don't get the opportunity to engage, sadly this is one event a year, then of course there's a significant danger that we lose that opportunity for the wider economy. I'll just point out, by the way, that you're, you're actually sitting in John Swinney's seat at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, I do know John, so yes, <laughs> maybe you won't mind. to write him a wee note and stick it in the drawer there. So. Um, <laughs> Keith, can I just ask you, I mean, I, I, mean just, I think all MSPs would be slightly disappointed by what you say, uh, all MSPs from all parties, including the government, because the parliament was set up to be open, transparent, and to be constantly engaging with 
people from all backgrounds, but particularly the business community. Uh, but perhaps, Keith, if I could ask you to just to respond first. Uh, well, just first of all, on the point about the seat that you're sitting in, I've uh, twice been challenged by Ian Wood today, and I now see that he's sitting in my seat, so I don't know what uh, the nature of those challenges were, but congratulations, uh, Ian, well done. Um, I think I would want to say that I speak for all the parts of government where you've had a good experience, um, and Derek Mackay will have to speak for uh, finance. I would say that at the time that you're probably trying to engage with them, and I don't know all the details of having done that, um, he was probably under quite a lot of pressure. But nevertheless, the fact that the First Minister has said that she'll make sure that that meeting takes place, uh, I think is uh, the right way to deal with it. And again, I'm happy to be involved. Paul Wheelhouse, my colleague, is sitting about four rows back from you, who's the Government's Energy Minister as well. Both he and I made representations on behalf of your sector in terms of the uh, rates uh, situation. It was a, a particular case to be made for that there. And I entirely agree with you in terms of the potential for job creation in the sector. I think we would say we've been pretty um, miffed about recent uh, last few years changes to the support structures in terms of uh, renewables generally from the UK and we're trying to get a more level playing field and rates will be part of that um, scenario. So we should uh, respond. I think just it gives me the chance to say more generally on business engagement which is a fundamental point that you're raising. I think a number of the large organisations which are represented here, the Scottish Government asks a lot of them, and the Parliament will also do, MSPs will also do so, to be involved in different forums. And I think we have to continually strive to make sure that we acknowledge that they have limited resource to engage. Um, and we also have limited resource to engage, so we've got to make sure it's most effective. But within that, we also have to make sure we're always available for individual uh, representations and as far as it's practically possible. And that's the only way you can keep up to date. We think, certainly Paul Wheelhouse and myself think, we do that, uh, Paul in particular in the energy sector, but whenever we fail to do it, the, th the important thing is that we correct it, which hopefully the First Minister has done this morning. I'm not going to bring all four speakers in on every question, because that it would get repetitive, I think. Um, Tavish, I wonder if I could just ask you on, to perhaps add a few okay, comments so and then I'll bring... Uh, I mean, look, look, just uh, three very quick points. Firstly, do we need a joined-up energy policy UK-wide? Yes, we darn well do. Um, so I support Keith's um, uh, aspiration to achieve that in conjunction with the UK government. Secondly, on business rates... Um, not just your sector, but our numbers are still pretty worried about what's going on. Um, I, uh, we had a meeting in here Tuesday night, I think, of a cross-party group on fishing, and a fish processor from Peterhead explained that his business rates were 40% more expensive than his competitor in Grimsby, head-to-head -head competition across the other side of the border. So I know the, the, our own government here are, are aware of those arguments, but um, I think, still think there's an awful lot to do. For some of us, Barclay didn't go far enough, but th th that's, uh, uh, that's different. And thirdly, on, on, on the presiding officer's point, yeah, I'm, I share that concern that you don't find our parliament accessible. To be honest, if you need to get to Keith and his colleagues, um, the best way, if I may be so bold, and Keith will not thank me for saying this, is knock on their constituency door. When I was a minister, I, when I was a minister, and Jackie did have the same, I had three businesses one day, couldn't get through my civil servants, flew to Shetland and walked into my constituency office. And, you know, so there are ways to get to all of us, but I genuinely believe Keith and his colleagues, uh, people across politics are uh, generally are better by um, being as available as they can be, and we don't try and hide from, from anyone, no matter how str strong their views are or how critical you are of something we may be seeing. Hmm. Okay, I'm just going to bring uh, Carolyn Curry. Yes, do you want to stand up, Carolyn? You'll find okay, it. thanks. I'm uh, Carolyn Curry. I'm from Women's Enterprise uh, Scotland. Um, and, and my question is around enterprise support for, for women. We regularly research and survey um, the business landscape for women-led businesses. Um, and in our last survey, 78% uh, of respondents said that business support services should be more aware of the differences between women-led and male-led businesses. Um, and I would also add that 91% of these women-led businesses responding were predicting business growth. We need to get better at providing gender-specific support for women. Repeatedly coming back in research is the evidence that women face different challenges in business to men, yet if we put that support in place, we heard this morning, we can boost our economy to the tune of nearly £8 billion, potentially circumnavigating the impact of Brexit in, in the way there. Um, and the key thing is these businesses are projecting growth. Isn't that what we wish to hear? Isn't that what we want to see happening in our economy? So my question, therefore, is 
what are we doing about providing that support that has been asked for repeatedly, that research shows is required and would help us to boost our economy, what is government doing and what are MSPs doing to encourage and help uh, government to put that uh, support in place. Thanks, Caroline. Uh, Dean, can I put it to you first and then Jackie? Is that Sure. Th thanks very much, Carolyn, for the question. Um, as you know, at the Economy Committee, we published earlier this year a report on the gender pay gap. And while it's not specifically uh, related to enterprise, we did take evidence about uh, the challenges women face in enterprise in a startup context. And I think there are a number of issues to address. I won't go into them all, although we are having a debate next week on the gender pay gap, which you're welcome to join. Um, I think one of the key issues we heard about was uh, education. It starts at a very early stage where we um, uh, sometimes, in terms of career guidance, we might not give the same message uh, to, to girls as we do boys. And we should encourage, I think, uh, girls to participate more in STEM subjects, both at school, but probably more importantly, going through to university. And I think that's why, uh, his, for historical reasons, uh, women have a higher participation in lower paid sectors and men have a higher um, uh, participation in the higher paid sectors, for example, STEM. And that, that results, one of the results, uh, or one of the drivers of, of the gender pay gap. In terms of enterprise, I think the strategic board is a step in the right direction. I think that hard alignment between the skills agencies and enterprise agencies is going to be very important so that they're all heading in, in the right direction. And I thought Nora Senior's speech today was, was, very, was excellent because it really identified some of the challenges that we need to address in terms of enterprise, innovation and, and otherwise. So I think it is something certainly the Economy Committee is aware of and I think uh, going forward it's an issue we hope to address. Yes, and I think the, the Parliament's actually published information on our gender pay gap um, next week. I think. Jackie. Yep, um, you've already been given the advert for tuning in next Wednesday, so I hope some of you will do. Um, you may see some of your ideas reflected back at you, yes. but, but, but certainly it's the case that I think there is an increasing kind of focus on um, how we ensure that there is a, a better gender balance in the workforce, um, not for you know, reasons that we, we believe 50-50 in and of itself is a good thing, but actually because it's such an untapped opportunity. There's such potential there. And if we can lever in £8 billion to the Scottish economy, then for goodness sake, we should be going after that. Um, so whether it's the pay gap, whether it's flexible working, um, we want to increase women's partic participation in the economy. And what I would say to Carolyn, you know, in response to her question, frankly, we're not doing enough. Um, and I hope Keith will take some of this away. But until we get agencies like Scottish Enterprise mainstreaming gender consideration um, in, in some of their programmes and particularly in how we support women-led businesses. Unless we get Business Gateway understanding that, because a lot of women, that will be their first contact um, with any business support. And unless we get that support, that access to finance, actually suiting and meeting the difference that there is, then we won't succeed. But the ambition should be to tap that untapped potential. I want to go across it, yes. Thank you very much. Um, Alistair Ross um, from the Association of British Insurers. Um, I think there's been a lot of interesting discussions today. I think we've, we've, we've all learned quite a bit. I would make an observation, though, that I think the conversations tend to default towards manufacturing. Now, that's for very understandable reasons, because we've got a lot of scope to improve in terms of manufacturing in Scotland. However, it does risk overlooking the fact that I think around about three quarters of the Scottish economy is services. Now, whether that's in areas like retail or in tourism, or in business services. I mean, to give you an example, my own sector in insurance. Insurance is worth about a billion pounds per annum in terms of GVA to the Glasgow economy. And we support 10,500 jobs, which is almost double the employment supported by the shipyards. But Glasgow is always, I think, going to be synonymous with heavy industry and ships as opposed to insurance. But it, it just poses some questions in my mind. I mean, the first minister mentioned earlier, Glasgow is the European capital for satellite manufacture, which is great. Insurance in Glasgow actually supports more jobs and contributes more to the economy than the entire Scottish Space Agency. So I, I'd just like to get an idea from, from the panel. What priority do you put on the service sector when we've heard so much about manufacturing this morning? Um, here, Keith, can I go back to you and you start with this round? Yeah, and Alistair has made that point a number of times before. And I think it is the case when you are... Um, perhaps pushing forward a particular, uh, not new area, but um, 
uh, a new emphasis, then you do stand uh, liable to be accused of uh, not giving sufficient emphasis to um, other areas. There is no question about the importance of uh, uh, the insurance, uh, the assurance um, um, sector in Scotland is hugely important and not always obvious to everybody, far less politicians. It can be something that can be quite quietly done in the background, but provides, not far from where I live, huge numbers of jobs uh, in central Scotland, uh, as well as what's been said in Glasgow. I think, though, the point the First Minister was making, uh, and it's true in the programme for government, is we do need to have recoup some of the ground we've lost in terms of manufacturing over many years and it's the idea that we and the program for government said this explicitly we start to build and innovate those things otherwise we just consume from elsewhere because there are major benefits to doing that so it's the fact that it's shrunk so much i mean you could say of course it's great the service sector and uh, financial sector has grown as much as it has done but we are looking at what we have to do to try and grow the manufacturing sector sector not at the expense of the service sector we want both to prosper but I think if, if it's a corrective uh, from Alistair to say that we shouldn't forget and should continually remind people of the importance uh, of the financial sector more generally and the insurance sector, certainly we are well seized of that. But um, just now, I think there is quite rightly a big focus and partly um, emphasised by Brexit and the threat that Brexit represents on manufacturing. There's a big opportunity there. The truth is we should look for opportunities in all sectors and how we can protect and promote the insurance sector has got to be part of that. So I take on board the point. I think Tavish wanted to add a brief comment. Just, no. just to say, Alistair, and you won't thank me for this, but politicians like uh, bright, exciting new things like space. And, and therefore, uh, whoever the First Minister of the day is at this time is bound to seize on something like that, particularly if she represents Glasgow constituency. It's not a criticism, it's just how it is. So you represent a, a part of the world which is steady and we take for granted. Yes, of course we do. Does it, is it important? Yes, of course it is. But the way politics works, you know, how many, how many column inches will poor old Keith get if he makes a learned speech about the insurance sector compared to saying, do you know about space, folks? It's just the nature of the world we live in, I'm afraid. It doesn't in any way undermine how important your sector is. It's just the nature of what we are. And Dean, you wanted to add? Oh, and Jack, you went in as well, though. Sure. I, I, Alison makes a very good point. I mean, the financial sector alone is 10% of the economy, 180,000 jobs, uh, 90,000 direct and indirect. FinTech is a major opportunity for us going forward. Um, Edinburgh is one of the Edinburgh and Glasgow uh, combined are, are, are massive financial centres and we have a real opportunity uh, in e-commerce e and also in FinTech to, to lead the world and uh, create um, innovation. Sometimes innovation productivity is seen as a, a manufacturing issue but actually if we get innovation right and productivity right in the, the financial sector and services sector that can really add value as well. Um, just a brief comment. Um, most of you will know that Scottish Enterprise have six growth sectors. Financial services is one of them. That was the only sector that actually performed um, well and grew. The rest didn't. Um, so that maybe says something to you about the importance of, of financial services to our economy. Um, and let me just make a novel suggestion. I'm sure people in space need insurance. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. My name is Roddy Gow. I'm the chairman and founder of the Asia Scotland Institute. David Birrell, my, our director, is next to me. Our mission is to educate and inspire tomorrow's leaders in Scotland and to get them to re-engage with Asia. And I want to just ask a question of the panel about engagement with the international markets. The population of Scotland is the same as that of Singapore, more or less. The Singaporean economy has grown incredibly. And my question is, what are we doing to help companies, many of which are represented in this chamber, to engage with those markets? And I have a very real concern about what seemed to me to be a great idea called the Global Scots. And as I travel around the world in the United States where I live when I'm not in Asia, I meet Global Scots who make it very clear to me that they do not feel that they are properly engaged with and they don't have a chance to do some of the things that they signed up for. So my question is, to help Scottish companies get into these markets, can we overhaul the Global Scott concept? Can we refresh it? And can we change the terms on which they are engaged to do business? Thank you. Thank you, Rudy. I think, Jackie, do you want to start I'd, off on that? I'd love to start off on that. Um, I was born and brought up in Hong Kong. Um, I have to say I was not conscious of any um, Scottish global network at that point. But, but you know, let, let me say to you, my brother, um, took his degree in engineering at Strathclyde University. He now is head of design and head of product design at Panasonic in California. 
Okay? He never once gets asked or used to do anything. So our Global Scott network may exist. We're not using them, and they want to be used. And therefore, I think a refresh of that, moving us away from the days of Donald Trump being one of our famous Global Scots, um, to, to actually people who have real connections with Scotland um, that, that are prepared to work with us. You know, when I think of, of Scottish diaspora, we are in every part of the world and have been for hundreds upon hundreds of years, and yet we don't exploit that. So I couldn't agree with you more. And Dean, I think you wanted to add a comment as well. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is something I could talk all day about. I spent 15 years in Asia, so I, I and like Donald Trump, I, uh, I'm a global Scot as well, but that's where the similarities end, hopefully. Um, well, yeah. I'm steady. Um, <laughs> I left myself open there, I know. Uh, look, I think, Roddy, you make a very good point. There is a huge network of, of Scots or friends of Scots, including actually alumni of uh, Scottish universities who go back to you know, wherever their homeland is and they've got a very close affinity to Scotland. We're not tapping that network. And uh, our exports to China are less than 1% of our exports. Exports to India, likewise, less than 1%. We need to see these opportunities. We need to grow our exports to those markets and tap into that uh, diaspora network. I, I think, without getting into the technicalities, uh, the Global Scott Network is, is a closed network. I think what we, we should be looking at is a more open, vibrant and dynamic network that basically connects our Scottish diaspora to uh, companies here in Scotland who are looking to access the markets. Okay. Now, come over here. Yes, David. You want to... David Lonsdale, uh, Scottish Retail Consortium. Um, Earlier, uh, the presiding officer, in fact, um, in his remarks at the beginning of the day, talked about um, some of the pressures affecting consumers in the economy at the moment. And obviously, um, with the budget coming up, and I think there's been a promise of a, a discussion paper about income tax and the, the political parties coming together to discuss that, I wonder to what extent um, the pressures on consumers that the presiding officer talked about um, and also the needs of the economy and the viewpoint of business will be reflected in those kind of decisions over the next few months. Any volunteers to take that particular uh, question? No, Keith. Jump in. Um, and, and this is a, a point that David's made a number of times, how closely um, related to the success of the Scottish retail uh, sector is the pound in people's pockets, I think, is uh, the spending power. And I have made uh, a number of comments in response, not least of which is, if you could have people paying the living wage, then the living wage is paid to people who do not, even at living wage standards, get a huge wage. They're not going to salt it away in a bank account. They'll spend it, by and large, buying things which the retail sector is selling to them because they have to do that. So, to me, the living wage makes economic sense. But uh, David's also made the point about tax. If tax is increased at all, that can reduce the amount of spending power. I would also say that we have uh, seen over a number of years now wage restraint and suppression of wages which is also limiting the spending power of people, especially in some of the public sector areas. So we want to look, the First Minister has also said that we will look to lift the public sector pay cap, which in its own will actually increase the amount of spending power against uh, for some of the people who are find, uh, finding it most difficult in society. So, of course, there are difficult decisions to make, and David is quite right to say that the government has said that we will want to consult on income tax proposals. There are a range of views in the Parliament here. Across this panel, you'll find a different range of views. Uh, and of course, it's possible to say, you could actually say that um, it, it can increase economic activity in the very way that uh, David uh, suggests. If you do things like lift the wage uh, cap, it can increase the spending power uh, in the economy. So these are difficult decisions and we're going to have to face them when we have the budget. And what I think is quite rightly being done is, let's say, not just within the parliament, the different political parties, but across Scotland, people want to contribute to that debate and tell us what their views in terms of tax and public spending are. There's a number of hands going up now, but so briefly, Jackie and then uh, Tavish. Um, we, we have a number of powers now in relation to taxation. I think it would be entirely appropriate for the Parliament to consider them. I agree with Keith's comments about the living wage and lifting the pay um, cap because we know that that spend predominantly is local and it goes back into the economy. But, but we do face a choice with taxation and Keith may or may not confirm this, but my understanding is there's maybe a 600 million gap in this year's budget. It's quite a substantial am amount of money to take out, particularly if some areas are protected and others aren't. So whilst the Fraser of Allender Institute is forecasting a 3% um, reduction in budget, for unprotected areas, it could be as much as 10 to 12%. Those are choices we face. 
I don't want to see any further reduction in the amount of money we spend, for example, on education. I think one of the biggest economic development drivers is investing in your people um, and investing in the skills and knowledge of your people. If we resile from that, then what are we condemning the economy to in a decade's time? So these are really difficult choices. I think it's appropriate um, to talk about taxation, but I also think we need to be careful and understand how the fiscal framework operates, because the fiscal framework does mean that you know, if you start raising taxes, there may well be consequences for, for Barnet, and we need to just understand that and do this sensibly, but obviously do it in dialogue with you guys as well. Two points, uh, David. Um, the first uh, is a pretty simple one. Most MSPs' mailbags at the moment reflect health, health, and health again. Um, we had a debate in here just the other night where uh, one of our colleagues who represents Edinburgh pointed out the, la the lack of GPs here in the capital city of Scotland, and I could take you home uh, to, my, to the islands I live in and show you the same. So Jackie's absolutely right about education, but the, the stress and pressure in the health uh, in the health sector is, is considerable. No help in the context of your question about consumers, but if it's about confidence, then, I, then the mailbag we're getting, or the email bag inbox we're getting these days, uh, I think reflects that, and that's, I think, where a lot of the d discussion will be around the uh, changing taxation, yay or nay. Second point is, if there's one thing I do hope um, the Scottish Government will do this time, it's to try and move us back towards three-year budgeting. Um, across the public sector and indeed in terms of business support, the, the certainty around um, funding for our enterprise agencies, um, for other organisations that are key to work that you all do. Um, we have chopped and changed, and it's no, it's no one's fault, it's the way in which the political cycle and the, eco and the financial cycle has worked in the UK now over a number of years. But um, when there was more stability over a three-year period, it seemed to me that we could make slightly longer-term decisions. And the thing that pulls politics back all the time is the lack of an ability to take longer-term decisions. So three-year budgeting from the finance secretary allows organisations to take better longer-term decisions, which um, is the way it needs to go. Okay. And just behind you. Hello, Jackie Brayton from Grobiz in Perthshire. Um, this morning, Gordon Lindhurst mentioned in his talk that um, one of the recommendations of a recent Economy Committee report was to make care a sector. And that really rang, um, re gave me resonance because we've been working on a project in rural Perthshire where we've evolved a cooperative of 25 individual businesses, social, sole traders, social enterprises, who are all providing social care in a rural area very successfully. But it's one small model and we're really struggling to get uh, critical mass and to get funding and to, to extend that. Um, but social care is often seen just as a challenge, just as a, a problem. And what we see it as is a huge entrepreneurial opportunity because self-directed support allows people to choose what services they want to buy themselves. And the evidence in Highland Perthshire is that they exactly do that. So it's not just about buying care, it's about buying somebody who can take them out in an afternoon or... Um, provide specific support around therapies or whatever. So there's huge economic opportunities for small businesses in the area, particularly for female-owned businesses. Um, but what can we do, what, what can government and the parliament do to help to both promote that idea and to accelerate it and to get it away from being seen as a problem and being seen as a, an opportunity instead? Thanks very much. Um, Jackie, you're looking up expectedly first. Absolutely. So. Um, and, and we were very proud of this recommendation from the committee because, you know, it, when, you, when you talk about business, it's always seen as something that's perhaps maybe manufacturing or something that, that, that is a bit sexier than, than social care. Yet the expanding opportunities for employment and growth is actually in the social care market because we've got an expansion of childcare, we've got people getting older, requiring more care as they do so, and we do not have sufficient people coming through because it's regarded as low paid, you know, part time, um, and the majority of people involved are women, okay? We need to do something to raise the value 
in society about these types of jobs. We also need to make sure that the skills are there and we're driving up quality. And as a consequence of that, you also increase the reward for people um, operating in that sector. And to be blunt, the way to do it is not to kind of make it the responsibility of education or social work, but to make it the responsibility of Scottish enterprise. Let's have these as one of the growth sectors. Let's exploit the opportunity that we know is there because we can do good business out of this, as well as raising the profile of a sector that will help society. I know others went in, but there's a lot of people catching my eye now, so I'm just going to take some more questions. Lady just there, yes. Uh, Anne Johnson, Blaze Manufacturing Solutions. I'm from the uh, oil and gas supply chain, actually, but I'd like to bring up the soccer pick of the NHS, which I have to confess I've got a vested interest in, because I use it, my family use it, my friends use it, my community uses it. I think as business owners, it's time that we force the NHS into drastic change. Now, we're working with the Aberdeen Hospital that is looking into innovation because they've signed on to 30-year, 35-year, even in one instance, 50-year contracts to companies who have, there's no benefit to them to bring in innovation to the table. Now, oil and gas is quiet. We've diversified out of that. But as a little sideline, we're, we've engaged with the NHS completely free of charge because we recognise that we see on the news, just as viewers, that the NHS needs to see, save huge amounts of money. We have a huge concern as parents, as grandparents, that we want everybody to be able to access the NHS, and we want, we're want very proud of it. My question is, when we met with the NHS and we talked about the new innovation that's available and all the things they're doing that they don't need to do anymore, and they're just being ripped off on a monthly basis, a yearly basis, a decade basis, their hands are tied by central procurement. Is there something that can be done? I don't know if it's, if it's even within this room that anybody can comment on, but I urge you, this is radical times. There's a lot of companies that will genuinely help the NHS out, will maybe do it on a cost plus basis. You know, let's stop the global companies ripping off the NHS. They don't have the vested interest. They're not even in the UK. How about some local content as well? Maybe, maybe that could be a theme. Uh, Dean, I haven't... Do you mind if I bring you in on this one, and then we'll get some more questions as well? Sure. Uh, it's a great question, actually. It raises so many issues. Let, let me just touch on one of them. I think innovation in the public sector is going to be critical because demographic changes, uh, we know about the, the, the demographic changes, there, there is a limited budget. So we really do need to achieve more with that budget uh, in terms of the outputs. I think the discussion politically can focus on the inputs. It can focus on the budget and how much the budget is increasing. But there comes a time where the transmission mechanism actually might not work. So for every extra pound you spend, you're not getting additional output. And I think so. So there is a, a discussion to be had in terms of uh, budget, levels of spending, innovation. But I also think ultimately we're looking at public sector reform to make sure that we have a system in place that for every pound we spend on it, we're actually getting uh, an incremental output. So I think it's uh, part of a wider discussion that I think this, this uh, chamber and the government really need to uh, have a look at. Just ask this. Lady here, yes. Hi, my name is Lindsay Millen. I'm from Close the Gap. We work on women's labour market participation and we um, support the recommendations of the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee that care should be made a key sector um, and also uh, that the government should implement a gender pay gap strategy that aligns to the labour market strategy. It's really great to hear women's labour market equality and the pay gap being such a focus of the debate um, and content of the day. Women's inequality in the labour market is a drag on economic growth, both at a macro level and at an individual business level. Businesses that take action to address the causes of the pay gap are more productive, more innovative and more profitable. However, all too often, action to tackle gender inequality is framed as a cost to employers. So what I want to know is what more the Parliament and Government can do to encourage employers to see this differently and to see that the cost is not in taking the action, but in not taking the action. Very good. Um, Keith, Cameron Sager, do you want to respond yeah, first? I think uh, very good points, and I'd watched some of the discussion at the Economy Committee and also a subsequent discussion which the Parliament's um, Equalities and Human Rights uh, Committee had on this issue as well. And I think part of my answer would be in relation to something I said before. If you uh, take the point about um, 
gender pay gap, first of all, it's predominantly the case that women are in lower paid jobs. There is a gap there, very obviously. If you then start to try and do as much as you can in relation to uh, living wage, it's not the answer to all. But if you start to pull people up to a wage that you can actually live on, uh, then you start to address some of those issues. And that's also reflected in their push to try and have inclusive growth. And that, you know, it's a nice phrase. And actually, it was pretty unusual when the Scottish Government first came up with it. Mark Carney, the Governor of the Bank of England, told me that um, when he started going to G8 and G20 meetings, there was only two um, countries that mentioned it. One was um, President Obama, and I, f I forget the second one. It's much more accepted now, but what it actually means is, the very point that was made before, if you're not making sure that everybody shares in growth, and if, in particular, the largest section of your population, which is women, are not sharing in that growth, then you're not realising your true economic potential. So in the same way that there's an economic argument for the living wage, as well as a moral one, there is an economic argument for eliminating that pay gap, and it's also a moral one. It's not right, simply put, that somebody should get paid less for doing a job than somebody else just because of their gender. So I think what we're doing in the living wage, the First Minister mentioned that we have, as a country, we are the highest... Uh, proportion of people paid the living wage in the UK of the different countries of the UK up to 80 percent if we can eliminate the rest of that then it's not going to be the answer to the pay gap because you see it right the way through the wage system but at the bottom level perhaps where it's most keenly felt and the last point I would say we had a, a very good discussion in the parliament about a year ago with the Joseph Rowntree Foundation who did some work on this and two women who'd had an absolutely horrendous uh, employment experience um, terrible experience very insecure treated very badly they actually said it wasn't necessarily the wage that was the biggest thing. It was the, the fact they felt valued or the fact they felt devalued the jobs they had been doing. So I think that your point, the more general point about he, the, the esteem that people have for the job that they're doing is very important as well. I think we're getting better, but there's no question we've got more to do. Okay. I'm going to take another question here, but just say to the panel, I'm conscious I'm, I'm moving through because I want the audience and everybody here to be able to participate as much as possible. But feel free, if you feel that you want to pick up on some of the points, I've not given you a chance to feel free to do so. That's an excuse not to answer the question you've been asked, of course. Let's just ask a answer a different question. Yes, that lady there. It'll come on, don't worry. I think if you start speaking, it'll... Hello, Gillian Anderson. I, run, I own and run a small business in the construction industry. There's only seven of us. Um, I've heard a lot of talk today about productivity and about £8 billion that we could invest in the economy, etc. But I think that we're undervaluing all that businesses can offer. We don't just look at the bottom line, the turnover and then the profit. We look at um, how much we're actually putting into the community, but there's no way of actually measuring that. I'm not sure whether it's because I'm of my gender, whether I, I, I tend to look at things that way because I've got kids and, you know, I've got to look at, oh, sorry, the, the, whole, the whole picture. Um, but there must be a way to support businesses who want to actually make a difference at that level and to, to, in order to include that in the productivity figures because you know it's as important as anything else the investment that we put into the area and into the, the youths of the area and the schools and the, and the work experience that we offer how can we help companies to achieve similar goals and how can we value that in the same way as the pounds at the end of the day indeed um tavish want to you first go um, linda zans and um uh, two linders actually uh, together under one headline which is serene woods developing scotland's young workforce because it struck me that one of the one of the key reports that's been produced in devolution was that report uh, because of, for two reasons firstly it recognized what needs to happen to uh, encourage and enable uh, schools to be much more linked to colleges and to business so that uh, we valued uh, the vocational route into life as much as we valued and had traditionally have valued the academic route into life secondly it said for example in shetland that we need more women doing engineering it's a big shortage of engineers at home um, we need more girls coming out of the anderson high school and doing the learning partnership through our through our system into uh, into the uh, into the workplace and it's been really effective in that and it has also worked on care as well because we identified very early on in the same way that uh, the, your, the audience today has identified that care is a big challenge in terms of workforce planning uh, we wanted to make sure it wasn't just about old people it's also about people of all ages and the care that's needed and how to attract both boys and girls men and women into that area so again we did it at a younger age and we did it because of the developing Scotland's young work force program and that's the company point the businesses that we've got involved in that get a lot out of that they put a lot in by sh for sure 
but they are valued much more broadly than just pure economic, economic numbers of how many people they employ because they're involved in that area. So I think that uh, whole area is dynamic, it's exciting, and it's very, very important for uh, business because it absolutely allows great leaders to be in schools and to be in colleges and to achieve uh, many of the things that you've described here this morning. So I think that, for me, is a link between about three or four of the questions that were asked, including uh, the one about the NHS as well. I would, I would add that the, this issue, what you, what you measure, and therefore reflecting what you value, is an issue that uh, uh, plagues us all in, in Parliament and Government. And the, the Government under John Swinney launched the NPF, the National Performance Framework, a few years ago, just to try and move away from simply measuring things by uh, uh, hard accounting and actually place a value on well-being and other uh, indicators. Uh, and we're still uh, making progress. I think, Keith, yes. Yeah. I very much agree with what the presiding officer has just said, but to go back to your point, and it's not the only way in which you can try and improve people's awareness of the contribution to society that businesses make, but we do have, as you heard from Nora Senior, the establishment of the strategic board, that's going to have a new analytical unit which is specifically going to look at all the ec economic data that we produce currently, how relevant and fit for purpose it is. And it's exactly that kind of measure that you've talked about could be something they'd wish to consider as well. Should we start quantifying it so people become more aware of it and more likely to contribute towards it. Dean, you want to brief Just two points. Uh, the, we, uh, the Economy Committee, we're doing a data inquiry right now, and it's, um, as, as Keith said, it's looking at wider measures of, of economic uh, well-being. It's not, not just GDP, uh, looking at uh, the index for well-being uh, that, that measures economic growth plus education levels and life expectancy. And that more holistic measurement of, of outcomes, I think, is to be welcomed. And the other thing is uh, touching on the kind of form of enterprise. I, I think across the UK we're seeing increasing interest in social enterprise and different models of business that don't just look at the bottom line, as you suggest. It looks at the impact on the community and stakeholders, and I think that's something we should welcome. Okay. Uh, Mary Hi folks, I'm uh, Mary Damer from Word Up Communications in Glasgow. Uh, we've heard a lot this morning, a lot of emphasis on growth, innovation and internationalism. Um, but as a sole trader, I do share some of those ambitions, although my internationalism aspirations are perhaps a little bit more limited. But us micro-businesses play a hugely important part in the Scottish economy. And if we're serious, for example, about encouraging more women to join in business, many of them will be micro-businesses and sole traders. So I'd like to ask you what you, as parliamentarians who represent us in the economic, circ in economic circles, do uh, to support and promote micros. Jackie, do you mind if I ask you to? Not at all. And, and I absolutely get that micro businesses are important in my constituency. That's where the area of growth is. Um, and I'm not convinced we necessarily provide enough support um, or you know, the financial tools available for people to take that step. Um, but the value of it is enormous because you know, a micro business may start as one person, but they end up perhaps employing two, three, four um, and more. And because they are so local, the opportunities in labour market terms are, are very much centred on my area. If we're honest, the business birth rate in Scotland isn't great. Okay? And that to me suggests something about the health of the economy. So helping businesses to start up, to grow, to remove some of the barriers, I think is key. Now, Business Gateway has been devolved to local authorities, and I have to be honest, in some areas they work really, really well, and in other areas they're not as good as their, their, their counterparts. Um, and we need to get to a gold standard about the kind of support that is offered to micro-businesses and indeed SMEs. Um, so, so that's where I would put my focus initially. Gentlemen, there it is. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Nick Morris from Station House Cookery School in Kukubri, Dumfries and Galloway. And my questions certainly link into the questions regarding the NHS. Uh, in today's age, as I understand, one of the greatest strains on our NHS is dietary-related illness. And at the same time, uh, if, for example, in our local primary school, we have no facilities whatsoever to teach the primary age children about food and drink, um, I have actually pledged a set amount of time through my business to be given free to the local primary school. Um, but my first question would be, what can we do to actually raise the time in our schools to ensure that young people are learning how to cook for themselves, which they're not at the moment, which will have a, a knock-on effect on the NHS in generations to come? 
Um, and the second question, which I believe is linked, is regarding advertising standards for our fast food industry, very much focused on young children. Um, to me, it seems really quite unregulated when we can have uh, adverts like don't cook, just eat, for example, purely focused on the takeaway service. Um, you were mentioning, Tavish, about the long-term effects on the, the, the NHS. Surely these two issues are two issues that have to be addressed. And do you mind if I, just as an education spokesperson, Tavish, do you mind if I bring you in? And um, in? Well, home ec teachers would be a good place. To, no, absolutely, very fair point, presiding officer. Um, uh, there is a national shortage in, in many areas of our teaching um, profession at the moment, but one which I was frankly surprised at until I saw the stats was on home ec teachers. So I guess that's one answer. Um, we had a particularly brilliant home ec teacher in one of the schools in my constituency who's just left to go to Stirling, actually, may even be in, in Keyspatch, but, and she will do a wonderful job in a bigger school down there, her family have moved but she was telling me on the boat from Lerwick down to Aberdeen the other day um, about the shortage across the country and she said you need to push more on in this area because um, for, the, for the obvious reasons so that's one answer the second one on um, I think is on procurement and local food um, we could do more uh, with our schools and indeed with the NHS as well in, in our local areas to have procurement based on sourcing more local produce there's lots of obvious examples and advantages around food miles and so on and so forth but Fundamentally, it also helps, of course, small local food producing businesses, never mind the primary agricultural sector. And uh, many of us have worked a lot for a long time on trying to encourage government to do more in this. And I think the food and drink strategy the government have got is good, but it could do more in, in this area. I don't know the answer on advertising. We, we have limited powers, I think, on advertising in terms of what we could do. But I think self-evidently, most of us in politics here would try to make, take a much blunter line about allowing the kind of advertising you've described to be near our schools. Uh, Keith first session. Very briefly on the last point that Tavis makes, he's absolutely right that the, it's the Advertising Standards Authority, but perhaps more encouragingly, I've met with them a couple of times recently, uh, and they've said, how do we make our presence more keenly felt in Scotland? Well, I've said to them, if you can take some high-profile cases forward, um, then there's more chance, which are relevant to um, Scotland in particular, then there's more chance of you increasing your profile. So the, I think there's a willingness on their part. I don't, obviously, I'm not making comment on a specific uh, case. In relation to education at primary level, well, there's no inhibition. In fact, there's every encouragement through the Curriculum for Excellence for teachers to teach about health and well-being. So there's no inhibition there. I don't know if part of your question was about the physical facilities in schools. Well, I think we've seen a, a dramatic improvement in that over recent years, not just this administration, but the previous one. But there are still some, in particular primary schools, where it has to be improved. And that programme will continue until we get every primary school up to the required standard. And the gentleman in the front row there, yes. Thank you. Um, Pete Moforth from Indes in, in Glasgow. Um, an observation and, a, and a, a short question. The observation is I, I, I came here a bit cynical to, 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 to this event, and I know that politicians very often on the receiving end of... But can I say the exact opposite is, is true? I, I've been you know, almost on the verge of being shocked by, by how warmly, the, you know, from my personal experience, the engagement has been with the politicians and, and how the arguments for, for what, what, I mean, my, my area of interest is e-commerce and, and, and how well um, politicians have responded to that, you know, given that, you know, half the people who do e-commerce are, are led, these businesses are led by women and there's quite a few micro businesses that trade and export quite successfully as individuals. So maybe, maybe it's a topic hitting the right tick boxes. Um, but I guess... And, and even when the First Minister has spoken so positively about the subject dur during her um, talk earlier, my question is, how, how warm and confident should I be that what has transpired uh, today is actually going to happen? <laughs> <laughs> So, Jackie and Dean, do you want to be the ones to <laughs> cynically <laughs> disabuse? No, no, no. no. Um, I, I hope that cynicism doesn't return. But, you know, we are very good at talking about yeah. things. We are less good at implementing them. And that's where I think the partnership with business is so critically important. You know, I, I like the fact that Scotland is a small place. I like the fact that we can engage with each other. You know, I hope pick the phone up to each other um, and complain as well as praise. Um, but actually where we sometimes fall down is our aspiration is not matched by our delivery. And we need you as partners in that. Um, because sometimes, you know, the, the machinery of government moves slowly. Um, and that's not a deliberate thing. It's just 
it's the way it is. And we need to get to be a little bit more, um, well, less cautious, less risk adverse. Let's try things, let's do them. Um, because I think the benefit of it being a small place and us knowing everybody um, is, is self-evident. So don't be too disappointed or cynical. But what I would say to you is there are plenty of opportunities to engage with MSPs, to engage with the Economy Committee or other committees, to engage with government. You know, ministers are accessible. Um, and if they're not, you can come through us and we shout at them in the chamber. There's lots of opportunities for you. So I wouldn't be cynical. And Dean. It's, it's a great question. I think your optimism is well-founded. I, I think there is, uh, Scotland's got tremendous potential. World-class universities, uh, world-class cities, world-class workforce we really need to work together to realise that potential. On uh, digital and broadband, the discussion can be about um, cables and uh, cabinets, but I think more importantly, we need a digital strategy, a strategy to maximise on the, the opportunities available for, for e-commerce, and I think that's where business comes in because you guys will understand the opportunities, you'll understand what you need, and that's the dialogue we need back from you to educate us as to what, what you need to make uh, to take advantage of, of those opportunities. The other thing I would say is that this place is not short of policy. You know, there's lots of policy announcements from all parties. I think what really needs to, the focus should be on implementation. I think that's where things have fallen down, and all, there's old business saying, you know, it's all very well having a first-class strategy, but unless you implement it, you know, it's not worth the paper it's written on. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a building, a growing consensus around focusing on uh, implementing policy and, and for that to be a real focus going forward. Yes, and just to add to that, it, rather than cynicism, if I could use the word frustration, because it's, it's a frustration that's shared by uh, politicians too, in the sense that um, quite often we debate issues um, at length, and it takes repetition over many years, often, just for, uh, for the public to even recognise that we're talking about a subject, and then for that uh, behavioural change. Um, projects, we, we're in here, there's, there's a number of MSPs who have been here for a number of years, I won't embarrass them by saying how long, and we are debating issues now, which we've debated five years ago and ten years ago, but change is incremental sometimes, so it, it's, it, it's not that we're ignoring you, it's that it sometimes changes difficult, that's all. Now, I'm going to bring... Serene wants to ask a question, a really difficult question, I think, uh, and it's also I'm just conscious of the, the time. Uh, Keith, I'm going to ask you to speak shortly, so, but I would ask the rest of the panel, if I may, just to think about concluding remarks as well as responding to Serene's question. Serene. Sorry. Um, just a quick word on the relevance of the economic performance um, and employment um, in terms of spending priorities. I uh, completely agree that health and education, not just politically, but, but de facto, are incredibly important. But we absolutely must have some real focus in the medium term on improving our economic performance and improving our GDP. Because if, if we're really going to solve our problems in the long term, we need to earn more money. We need to economically perform better. We need to earn more money. So we're just coming to the end of, and, and you, know, you talk implementation, the implementation of the the current skills and enterprise review is incredibly important, really important in translating what you've got. Um, and I'm just going to make the point again, um, if, we're really going, if that's really going to have an impact on our economic performance and on our jobs, I need to tell you from my review, leading the view on the, on the young people um, in employment, frankly, by far the strongest solution was to produce more, more employment, more good quality jobs for, for young people and, 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 and for creating... Um, creating wealth. The key thing right now in implementation is to get the strength of the agencies, those who will be in touch with the punters, those who will be impacting and affecting what's actually happening in the business and in the economy. So it's very important you get that right. Thank you. See you. So, um, Jackie first. I couldn't agree more. I think growth absolutely has to be the ambition of the Scottish Government working with all of you in business. Uh, if we have a growing economy, Employment is likely to be higher, you know, skill levels are likely to be better, and you know, we get more money to spend on public services. So you know, what's not to like about that, to be frank? Um, and if we're being honest, our Scottish economy is fragile. You know, it's, it's not growing at the rate we would want. Forecasts suggest 1%, 1.2%, um, and we regularly underperform the rest of the UK. But I am absolutely 
seized with the idea that there are huge opportunities out there. We've discussed in some of the workshops the low-hanging fruit that we could actually exploit as businesses, as government, as parliament. Um, but there are also medium and long-term things we need to get right now. And if the, there is ever a time where you know, I've wanted politics to be less short-term, it is now because we have real challenges ahead. And unless we plan for the medium and long term, my fear is we won't meet those challenges. But we have the talent, the skills, the opportunity, the ambition sitting in this room and outside this room to actually make it happen. Um, and I will certainly pledge my party and myself, um, even though I might have been here a long time, according to the presiding officer, um, to doing exactly that. Tavish. Can I just make three points? I mean, I fundamentally agree with the with Serene's contentions and, and indeed Jackie's analysis. So, so three very quick points. The first is uh, I would want to ensure or encourage more business involvement in the strategic decisions that we do make. Um, I thought in the city region workshop we had earlier on, um, Lord Hockey made a very strong argument about the Glasgow City deal uh, ultimately in, in the first instance being the creation of the local government wish list on transport projects. And Keith very sensibly said said these things are evolving and changing, I, I would argue that needs to happen all the more so. So when the budget process happens in here, and David uh, does this all the time, but when the budget process happens in here, remember it's your budget as well, and you have an opportunity to influence that, either through your MSPs or through your government or both. Um, so I'd encourage that. Second point is, um, this is maybe my NHS point, when Leah Hutchison gave a presentation this morning, the bit that struck me most, as someone who's trying to get his, her mum, his mum into an appointment at our local health centre, is she described an appointment system. Why couldn't we ask our NHS to look at what, the, what Leah does and take it and use it to provide a much more efficient appointment system for the whole entire NHS, which, if I may say so, ain't too good at it? So I would like, uh, that's my one uh, private sector suggestion. And the final point is, I, I really do mean this, is it's your, this is your parliament. You know, I, I, the presiding officer was right in his early remarks. It's, it's your opportunity to use this. That's why this conference, I think, is really important, because it doesn't make us sit here and take it from you. But it is, it is your parliament. It is your budget process. It's your ability to influence, in this case, the economy committee as well. Uh, and the more you put into us, the better we'll be. So please remember that. And Dean. Um, look, I've got a simple view in life. We, we all want better services and better Scotland. To do that, we need to grow the pie. It's not about dividing up the pie. It's about growing the pie, and the private sector is critical to, to that. We need to expand the private sector in Scotland. There was an excellent Audit Scotland report last year that made this point precisely. Now, to do that, we need policies that encourage global innovation to come to Scotland, uh, high-paid jobs to come to Scotland, and we're about to embark on a debate on taxation. We, we face a new reality. Scotland is in tax competition with the rest of the UK, as well as the rest of the world. And I think to create those high-paid uh, jobs, to attract the global innovators of the world to come to Scotland, making Scotland the highest tax paid uh, tax part of the United Kingdom is not the answer. A nice controversial note to end on there. But uh, we're actually going to give, I'm going to, I'm going to give Keith the last word. Uh, but before I do, uh, can I ask you all to thank our, our panel for uh, answering all our questions as openly uh, as they have done? Now, if I could, I'd like to ask uh, our co-host, actually, the co-host of the, the, the Business in the Parliament Conference, uh, Keith Brown, MSP, Cabinet Secretary for Economy, Jobs and Fair Work, to come up and to address the conference. Thank you. I think, yes. You can put your Thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and also, uh, in case I forget, can I also thank previous speakers, the First Minister, uh, Leah Hutchin, uh, Nora Senior, for their uh, reflections uh, earlier on. Um, the point that Tavish Scott just made is, I think, a very important one, and it's very easy at this point to drive it home that this is your parliament. You're sitting in the chamber of the Scottish Parliament. And when I was first elected 10 years ago, like most MSPs, you bring groups into the chamber, and one day I came in and there was the then presiding officer, uh, Alec Ferguson, who turned around to the group that I brought in from my constituency and said, welcome to your parliament. So it's a very important point, I think, that Tavish is making, um, and it's driven home by the fact that you're sitting in these seats. 
And also, again, as Tavish is saying, it is your budget as well. It's your money we're going to be spending. So please uh, get in touch and let us know what your views on that uh, are. And I think that uh, underlines the importance of this event. Uh, it's one of a number of direct links that the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government has with the business community. And perhaps the most refreshing part for me today is hearing there was no cynicism on the Tory benches. So I was very appreciative of that. Just kidding, Dean, it's just a joke. Um, but to hear uh, that view expressed where somebody feels they've got a great deal out of today and is now looking to see how we follow that through is a challenge. Of course, it's a challenge to the government, but it's also a challenge to all the MSPs that are here as well. We have to try and live up to that. And what would be useful to know <clears throat> exactly what are those expectations? What are the things that you've heard today that you expect to see delivery on? And I have to say, both for MSPs and the government, uh, most people in most workshops will have heard contradictory things. So there's no way that we can achieve everything that everybody asked for, but it is important that we can demonstrate the effectiveness, the efficacy of this event. And I know the presiding officer himself has undertaken a review of uh, this event, I think, today. I understand that the figures are up in two years ago, and most people I've spoken to have found it to be a positive experience, but we have to build on that and make sure it stays relevant. <clears throat> Uh, obviously, the emphasis is in working with businesses in Scotland and as a government, and I'm speaking here on behalf of the government, we aim to enhance our engagement with businesses, and I've mentioned the fact that we are currently reviewing that, to build, uh, as all the MSPs you've heard from want to see, a stronger, fairer and a more sustainable Scottish economy. And we heard, as I mentioned from Nora Senior, about the role of business in the economy. And I think, from my own point of view, that bringing in a businesswoman of her standing for a key role such as the chair of the Enterprise and Skills Review Strategic Board demonstrates how highly we value the voice and experience of industry in developing our country. And I know that many people expected that that appointment would be a government minister. And people like uh, Ian Wood and others uh, suggested otherwise. I think that demonstrates both the fact that we're listening and it's a very good choice being made for that particular position. <clears throat> One of the workshops today looked in detail at the accessibility of parliament and government. And I'd like to highlight some of the ways in which uh, I feel that we can all benefit from a stronger, better collaboration between government and business. One of those is quite intangible, that you feel that it's accessible, that you feel if you really need to, you can get in touch. And I take on board the one point that was made where that didn't seem to work, and that's up to us to correct that. But events like this allow us to speak directly to the business world en masse. Uh, but that is only, of course, and it's bound to be only the tip of the iceberg. And so last year, Scottish government officials and ministers engaged directly with business at almost 500 events with over 1,000 business leaders. Uh, so we want to be clear that we are listening to you. And, you know, chief amongst that are people in my portfolio, Paul Wheelhouse, who's here, Jamie Hepburn, who deals with employability, but also the uh, First Minister, Deputy First Minister, and so on. And it is something we work very hard at. Tuesday night, I was up in Inverness talking to SCDI, uh, back down home after midnight, straight to talking to see SCDI the next day. Uh, and throughout the day, and virtually every day, we're meeting with businesses, either through your representative organisations or individually, and that's as it should be. But we have to make sure it's as effective as possible. Uh, business rates was mentioned, and I think I should mention that. Uh, and also, again, I think one of the problems was accessing the Barclay Review on that issue, I have to say that that is quite separate. Although it was initiated by the government, it's up to Ken Barclay how he goes about uh, gathering his evidence. But the establishment of that re review was basically uh, to underline the fact we want to listen to the concerns that you've said. And we've heard about renewables. It was also true the northeast in particular, also particularly true for the hospitality industry. And what's been produced so far are Ken Barclay's recommendations. Obviously, we've had a response from the Cabinet Secretary about how we intend to take uh, most of those forward, and also one or two that we want to take uh, more time about. But it is an example of the fact that business told us that rates had to be modernised and were taking steps to do uh, just that. And I was very pleased that uh, very quickly after Ken Barclay produced his review, Derek Mackay was here in the chamber uh, providing a positive response uh, to that review. And it's had a very positive response from most of the main business bodies, although I accept there are still issues that individual sectors uh, and businesses may have. Uh, procurement has been mentioned uh, a number of times, not least in relation to the NHS uh, previously. 
Now, I used to do procurement in the Scottish Government. It's a difficult thing, certainly to get everybody happy with the way it's done. You do have that tension. First of all, you have to make it transparent and fair to everybody. Uh, you also have to make it compliant as things stand within the European Union. And a great deal of the law underpinning procurement comes from the European Union. And also you want, there is nobody in this chamber from any party that does not want to see Scottish businesses, small and otherwise, winning these contracts. But if you were to close that completely, then you would also inevitably close off opportunities for Scottish businesses to win businesses elsewhere, because same people overseas would take protective, uh, protectionist uh, measures. So we have to try and make sure it's as fair as possible. And we try to do that, and it's quite possible we don't get it right. We have to listen to what's being said. And we, we certainly want to encourage the point that was made about innovation, uh, allowing for innovation. And the point about 50-year contracts in the NHS, I would certainly ask if it's possible to give me the details of that. It may well be Derek Mackay that has to respond because it comes into his area. I'd be very interested in hearing about that because, once again, there is unanimity in the Parliament. If we can save money on the NHS budget that allows us to deal with the pressures in it, then why would we not want to do that? But we do have procurement uh, rules which we have to, uh, have to abide by. We've been working to make sure that the, we improve our offering to businesses in Scotland to engage in the public procurement exercises. And as has been mentioned, SMEs make up the vast majority of Scottish businesses, so we're making it easier. Uh, the old PFI contracts were extremely different difficult for small businesses to get involved in, other than sometimes as subcontractors. So we've tried to address that. For example, we provided £157,000 this year to support the Supplier Development Programme, which provides free tender training and, and support to small businesses across Scotland. Industry representatives have been key in steering our procurement reform programme and in the development of tools used by suppliers as part of the procurement journey. So we are talking, when we come up with the reforms to procurement, we are talking to industry. You may come back and say, and I'm perfectly willing to hear that, it's not representative from industry, we think it is. But if you think there's a sector of industry that we're not listening to it, then please let us know that. Uh, and the collaboratively produced tools that we come up with try to make the process more user-friendly and more open to access for Scottish business. Now, I don't know, uh, I don't think any of us know, how Brexit is going to play out in full, but it certainly seems likely that's going to change some of the ground rules for procurement. So that liaison and discussion with the business base is extremely important over the coming months. Uh, the workshop that I was involved in was on uh, uh, city deals, uh, and of course, again, as Willie Hawhey mentioned, there are real uh, procurement opportunities for SMEs and others in the city deals. And of course, we have covered four of the cities, still three more with two city deals to do, and beyond that, potentially growth deals uh, in other parts of Scotland. So these each represent major procurement opportunities for the SME sector in Scotland. Uh, and the regional Partnerships which deliver the city and region deals bring together local authorities. Local authorities, like us, they want to see local businesses thrive. They have no prejudice trying to support some uh, areas uh, out with Scotland to win those uh, uh, contracts. So they're in the lead, they're in the vanguard of city deals, along with private sector partners. So there is nobody here that's trying to stop small businesses in Scotland, or even more locally than that, winning contracts. But we have to do it in a fair and legal way. That's the, the crucial part of it. Those partnerships also bring together um, economic development agencies, businesses, education, uh, and par excellence in a, the North East. Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire, as we heard in our workshop, through one, uh, one North East, is a fantastic example of that collaboration between the private sector. I would say, in that case, led by the private sector, not least um, through Ian Wood. And if you can get those kind of partnerships spreading across Scotland, which I know is what Ian is seeking to achieve, then we have no reason to stop that. Uh, but it's up to the private sector and those that should be working with them to make sure that happens and bring that forward. We want to see those regional partnerships, whether or not they're based on uh, the city deal areas as currently constructed. But we have to make sure that they represent their communities. And we've been clear that the, if those are to be established, and the government will look at any initiatives that come from that, then it has to involve the private sector. Um, Sir Tom Hunter also and Opportunity North East together have been instrumental in innovation projects uh, included in the Aberdeen City and Shire deal. And I'm looking at that, I'm not sure that Tom Hunter was involved in that. I think it was Ian Wood that was involved in that. So uh, that's one for the script writers there. Uh, but one of the most uh, important parts of that deal, and again, Ian mentioned it in our workshop, was the Oil and Gas Technology Centre. And one reason it's important to mention that is because Many of the city deals have at their heart infrastructure projects. This was about innovation. 
about trying to get new business, about uh, making sure that the supply sector in terms of the North, uh, North East is properly looked after, and that the reputation that we've got, particularly in subsea technology, is something that we can uh, take around the world. I went to the ADICEP conference in Abu Dhabi, where we had 80 Scottish suppliers, some of whom, if they're honest, looked to the North East, the North Sea alone, and realised, obviously, with the downturn in the oil price, they had to look further afield. So what we can do to help them, and working with the Oil and Gas Technology Centre, which we've supported along with the UK government, is very important. Uh, and Glasgow City Region has seen similar partnerships resulting in the launch, for example, of the Imaging Centre of Excellence, which brings together industry, health, as we talked about before, and academia. And that's been identified as contributing £88 million to the local economy. The most recent deal that we've signed is a city and region deal for Edinburgh. That includes £300 million for digital innovation. Interestingly, that also included housing. Not something that we would naturally go to in terms of a city deal, but it's quite clear that Edinburgh and the wider area need to have accessible, affordable housing if they're to grow further economically. So that's why that was included. Digital, I think Dean mentioned digital, uh, being a, a, a strong and growing sector in Scotland, uh, but also requiring us to make sure the infrastructure is there. In 2010, it was estimated that almost 200,000 people were in direct employment associated with Scotland's e-commerce. So we, want to, we are well aware, and we had a discussion about this previously, uh, again just over here, about the further potential there is uh, for e-commerce. So we want to further embrace digital, and in March this year we launched our digital strategy. We've invested significantly in skills and capability through, for example, digital superfast broadband. That delivers around £400 million of investment to extend fibre broadband throughout Scotland. And also Digital Boost, which was mentioned by the First Minister. It's a national training and advice service delivered by Business Gateway, which has received around £8 million of Scottish Government funding. Now, the First Minister gave us quite a frightening figure in terms of the 70 companies responsible for around 50% of our exports. Another figure is that if you go to Bavaria, which Paul Wheelhouse has visited, around 75%, and it goes back to a point that was made about a very small micro-business, 75% of all businesses in Bavaria export. In Scotland, it's around 7%. That gives you some idea of the potential that is there for growth. And that will, in large part, depend on things like digital connectivity, and we're well seized of that. We also have uh, Hello Digital, a digital excellence centre in Inverness, linked to High's work to roll out the next generation of internet across the region. And also Digital Tourism Scotland, a three-year project aimed at improving digital skills and capabilities of our vital tourism businesses. And digital, as we said in our workshop, is important. Of course, it's important for e-commerce. It's important for business. But for individuals, especially in rural areas, it's sometimes more important than the road or the rail network. The ability to access employment opportunities, education opportunities, and even health opportunities as well. So we have given the commitment that everybody, including all businesses, will be connected to superfast broadband by 2021. And the big fear in government is that somebody moves to St Kilda, and that presents us with a big challenge in terms of making sure that every last person is connected. But it's not just the giant firms who take advantage either. Small business can be successful in the market. And the ONS stats which have been produced show that businesses with less than 10 employees had a total e-commerce turnover of £21.2 billion in the UK in 2015. Uh, small and medium-sized businesses make up the vast majority of our Scottish business base and they employ around 1.2 million people. So we need to harness ambition to develop that market. And in March, the First Minister announced a £36 million digital growth fund to help our SMEs respond to those digital opportunities. Now, I mentioned international. The First Minister mentioned exports as well. Uh, there are clear uh, indicators that we have in terms of success for our economic strategies, such as in exporting. Since 2009, and this, this kind of contradicts what I've just said about the number of companies involved in exporting, but since 2007, and despite the global financial crisis, Scottish exports have increased by 41%. Uh, and in face of what I think, um, and was perhaps uh, very heavily hinted at by uh, Lee earlier on, uh, the enormous threat posed by Brexit, we are doing what we can to work with the business community through our economic development agencies. So that's got to involve, of necessity, greater international export ambition and supporting that ambition with practical assistance and expertise. And Roddy's points about uh, Global Scots, the points are taken on board. I've sp spoken to uh, Global Scots as a group previously. We're about to bring forward some new 
uh, innovations in terms of trade envoys, and it goes to Dean's point about making sure it's more focused. So those things have been taken on board. Uh, it's well known that exporting, I think the First Minister made this point, is linked to productivity. If you're exporting, it tends to be the case you're exporting into a more productive and competitive uh, economy in many cases. That, in turn, puts the pressure on you to be more uh, productive uh, here. One of the big challenges that the UK has got, and Scotland had an even bigger challenge than the UK, although we've substantially closed that gap, that we're still well behind the French and the Germans, and we have to cut, uh, further close that. So exporting and productivity have improved, but we have a way to go to make sure that we're in that top quartile of the OECD. And the last comments I would make are about inclusive employment, and many of the questions that we had during the Q&A just now were about that. And that is one of the ways that we can increase productivity by encouraging inclusive employment practices. Uh, there's clear evidence that more equal societies enjoy stronger, more sustainable and, sustain uh, and successful economies. And the UK is one of the most unequal uh, societies that we have, less so than the US, but one of the most unequal. And if you have a proportion of people, if it's women, if it's people sometimes with disabilities who are excluded from that economy, that growth, then you're not achieving your full potential. That's a simple point. So even if and I don't know anybody who doesn't accept the moral argument for making sure that everyone gets a fair share of uh, growth. Even if you don't accept that, and you look at it simply on economic grounds, we're not making the best use of the resources that we have. And if we did that, if we massively increased the number uh, of women-led uh, businesses, then of course we can start to see benefits in terms of the economy generally. Um, We've been supporting uh, that aim of inclusive growth through the business pledge, approaching now the 400th signatory. We're over 900 uh, Scots-based living wage accredited employers, around 80% of the population. But they're not just about doing the right thing. It's about beneficial business outcomes, uh, such as improved recruitment. For many businesses here, especially small businesses, you'll be well aware of the cost and the time that goes into recruitment and retention of staff, especially when you're sitting with around below 4% unemployment just now. Paying the living wage, recognising the value of your employees is good business for keeping uh, your own people, the people that you've invested in, uh, within the business. So that success, I think, is to be celebrated, and that's in the context of acknowledging that we are on a journey and that we've got a great deal to do to create an economy that is inclusive of place and inclusive of people. And through that Fair Work Agenda, which is part of my portfolio, we're committed to reducing the employment gap people with disabilities um, through the new delivery plan of Fairer Scotland for Disabled People. And one of the toughest things for any government, this or previous governments, to deal effectively with, but something we're determined to do. People from minority ethnic groups, again, we have an action plan being published uh, next month. And we've mentioned women through investing, for example, in the Trade Union Fair Work and Modernisation Fund, as well as the Family Friendly Working Scotland and Close the Gap initiatives, which you've heard about. All of that contributes towards developing an economy which thrives on inclusive growth, with the mutually reinforcing objectives also of increasing competitiveness, competitiveness and also tackling inequality. Now, at the root of this, I think, is uh, something I mentioned earlier on. We are an innovative, business-minded nation with, I think, a government that's working hard to support sustainable, inclusive economic growth. And we're making progress, and the government can do so much. But as came out in our workshop, one of the things is very intangible. It's about that idea of entrepreneurs going out and winning business. And I apologise for those that have heard me say this at the workshop, but in my constituency we have this thing, Johnny Walker's original book, where he's listed the recipe and the ingredients for producing his first batch of whisky. And if you go back to that time in Scotland, the way that people went out and won business, of course there were issues with language, maybe tariffs, and sometimes much more brutal uh, impediments to business in the past as well. But they went out and did it and didn't feel they had to wait for permission from government. They went out and won that business themselves. And I think that idea, and the idea you don't need permission from a development agency, a council, or the government, you can go out and do these things, and you'll be supported in them. It's a very intangible thing to have, but it's absolutely essential uh, to a successful economy. And the other point, as it happens in the US, if you do try something and you don't manage to be successful, the idea that society doesn't pile, pile in and condemn you forevermore, we've got to start encouraging that. That was part of what the First Minister said. We can't do it in isolation. We do have to have the feedback from this event and others. Also, the expertise and support of businesses who can tell us what we have to do to achieve that and also to help us with some bold programmes to create that world-class inclusive economy. So the government, and I know the parliament, uh, through the presiding officer, will continue to seek engagement with business uh, and continue to listen. Uh, the focus that we have, though, on inclusive growth, which 
I think is shared across all the parties in the Parliament, uh, aims to create a Scotland where we have the opportunity where you can thrive no matter where in Scotland you live or what your gender is or what your background is and where businesses can flourish and grow as part of that inclusive, fair and prosperous, innovative country. And again, and I hate to name check him again, but Dean, uh, my Conservative opponent, is exactly right. If we can increase the pie, then the issues that have been raised about health and education are easier to deal with. We all have a vested interest in increasing that pie, the growth in the economy in Scotland. And if this event... Uh, helps us do that, then it has to be a worthwhile thing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Keith, not just for your contribution there, but for your contribution to the whole conference. I would like to uh, repeat my thanks to all our speakers and panellists, to our MSP colleagues, many MSP colleagues, too many to mention here, but thank you. Most of all, my thanks to you members and representatives of the business community it's all about you i hope that you felt it was worthwhile i hope you're not frustrated i hope you do believe you were listened to and that you have made a difference i certainly would like to express my appreciation uh, for the benefit of your insights and experience and can i wish you all a safe journey home thank you